we are here and it's a great pleasure to be in this crowd of theorists. Uh, being half a theorist myself as a former student of Leonid Keldish, I appreciate that very much. Uh, but to tell, I'm going to tell you a different story. How actually to go from a really fundamental concept to a practical device, something what we've done in my group many, many times, um, just most recently going from the ideas of luminescent solar concentrator to two companies, one ubiquity um, in Los Alamos, successful startup, and uh, light to solar in Italy. Um, and uh, I believe we're very close uh, to another type of technology now emerging from what we have done for many uh, years in the group on and off. Okay, I'm going to talk about the problem uh, of uh, colloidal quantum dot uh, lasing again started as uh, an interesting concept. Uh, what happens if you want to make quantum box lace? How difficult is it, right? And why do we want this type of laces? And uh, then making, if you happen, I'm going to see it's kind of difficult. Okay, the saga started back in the days. This is the first demonstration of the lasing effect. Okay, uh, with not colloidal quantum dots, but with this uh, sample. So it's a historic artifact made in 1984 in St. Petersburg. Okay, this is quantum boxes first realized as a sample you can hold in your hand. This is, from 1984. This is 1984 actual sample. So we're going to study it in my lab now. It's Sasha's artifact, which actually he was an artifact keeper for all these years, made by Alexei Kimov and co-workers in St. Petersburg in Goya Institute. Okay, and uh, again, we use this type of samples to demonstrate the effect, right? Nobody paid attention to that. Nobody cared. Okay. <laughs> Paper is still cited just maybe 40 times. <clears throat> okay, following two immigrations, first uh, Germany and uh, then uh, the US, so I got in touch with Munji Berlin and got probably the best colloidal quantum samples in the world at that time. And started thinking, you know, how it works and a lot of interesting physics emerged. So published a bunch of fundamental papers, but they actually were able to demonstrate this amplified spontaneous emission, single pass lasing, essentially. So you had the cavity, you got the laser. And everybody did that. Following the Gordon conference, when we presented these results, he came back to Israel and uh, did the micro cavity lasing device. Okay, so it was very neat. Okay, and that's still a long road, right? Uh, which we've done just showing that you can do the same now, but with electrically pumped quantum dots. And this is very important milestone that it can become a device which people will be interested in, okay? So that's what you can probably already sell uh, to consumers, okay? And uh, still a little bit of motivation. So why do we want this type of lasers which are based on solution processable materials and primary motivation? I think that's the biggest impact, of course, is in the area of photonics and electronic. Finally, using that, you can put electronic circuit and the photonic circuit on the same silicon chip. It's humongous need right now for this type of devices. DARPA funds multi-billion program just to make it happen. It's Lumos program. Okay, and, and this is difficult right now because all microelectronics silicon based group four, all of the electronics based on free fives, okay, gallium nitride, indium arsenide. Okay, it's impossible to grow high quality free five on group four. Many people try, it doesn't work. Okay, that's why the big need for solution processable uh, materials, which uh, eventually uh, can become amplifiers in places. Okay, and of course, there's certain things you can do much better in quantum information. You had something like that. And I would say there are all these other applications which um, people are thinking about traditional optical communication, ultimate security when you put your laser uh, on your dollar banknote, uh, uh, thinking about even lasing mail polish. Okay. Uh, as I said, uh, so this goal has been pursued for decades, okay, starting with early work here, Santa Barbara and Higgers group, okay, working with polymers, trying to make them lace. Okay, there's still no electrically pumped polymer lasers, right? Okay, people have been working with dyes, working with 
organic molecules, small organic molecules dies, they still no device, okay? And seems like quantum dots that is happening now, and there are certain intrinsic advantages of the quantum dot materials versus, say, polymers when you need always a new molecule, if you want to change the color with quantum dots, it's, it's much easier. It's size control, maybe composition control, you get all this colors, but there are also advantages from the standpoint of your, of lasers, okay? So this uh, theory paper published long ago, 1992, Arakawa and Sakaki, they considered optical gain media based on the bulk material, then reduced dimensionality in one direction, quantum well, going to the quantum wire, and finally to the box. This is how they called it, it's a quantum dot, and they see this progressive reduction in the threshold, which is very understandable when you reduce the dimensionality, you, you reduce the degeneracy of the bandage states, okay? And in order to come to the optical gain threshold, you need to achieve the state of transparency, you need to saturate the bandage state, and in the case of the quantum dot, in simple system, you have just two-fold degenerate state. You create a single exit onto a quantum dot and you reach the state of the optical gain threshold and that leads to this ultimately low thresholds. Okay, so of course we already heard from Muri and from other people, quantum dots is now a commercial quality material, sufficiently robust, produced in large amounts and used in displays and soon will be used in light. Okay, this is the simplest application right now of the quantum dot. It took three decades to develop. <laughs> um, you start with a uh, blue photons. Typically, it's backlight of gallium nitride type LED. It's absorbed by the quantum dot and you emit it at the desired color. Typically, two or three types of the quantum dots are incorporated in your display. And the beauty, of course, very narrow emission line width. And that leads to the high color purity. For example, this telecast. Uh, standard 2020, so was achieved by the quantum dots. Okay, now virtually all display and uh, television set companies are working with the quantum dots. In fact, people say that even in iPhone, we have quantum dots, although nobody would disclose that to you. Okay, so it's extremely high uh, color purity, okay, which is provided by this type of uh, materials. Okay, so when we talk about laser, so we need a different effect. We need effect of stimulated emission, laser light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, you need a special state of matter called population inversion. You need more species in the excited state in the, than in the ground state. In this case, if you send a photon onto a new material, it won't be absorbed. It's initiate the emission of the second photon. You have two photons and you have two free quantum dots and that would stimulate the avalanche leading eventually to the laser effect. Question is how difficult to produce the state of population inversion from the quantum dot, okay? And second question, how difficult it to maintain, okay? Let's talk about that, okay? Uh, then I'm gonna approximate the quantum dot by a simple quantum box, okay? Two-fold spin degenerate ground state, so we have two electrons in the conduction band, okay? You excite one electron across the band gap, you generate a single exit on this state. That's what is used in this place. It can emit light very efficiently with 100% quantum yield. Unfortunately, this state does not amplify light because if you send a photon, this photon can either initiate stimulated emission by this electron, which is in the conduction band, or be absorbed by the electron, which still sits in the valence band. So overall effect, is no absorption, but no optical gain either. This is the station of optical transparency. You remember what I told you, single exciton brings us to the state of the optical gain threshold, okay? And the reason is twofold degeneracy. You always have two electrons in the ground state, okay? And the tricks which we did in our work, we're trying to split this degeneracy. I'm not gonna talk about that. There's no time about, to talk about that. In order to initiate optical gain, to produce optical gain, you have to excite the second electron across the band gap. You have to generate a bioxiton, and this is the state which amplifies light. Something what we realized back in the 1999. Okay, in order to obtain optical gain and laser, you actually need the bioxiton, not a single exciton, okay? And this is when we started looking at the K-dynamics of 
the state, and this is when we became very, very disappointed. Okay, single exciton in cast selenite quantum dots lives for 20 nanoseconds if you don't uh, have bypassing non radiative channels, radiative lifetime about 20 nanoseconds. You excite now a single exciton, and something dramatic happened, okay? This is when I came to Los Alamos, built the transit absorption system and could look at bioxitonic dynamics, going from single exciton to bioxiton, triaxiton, four exciton. The dynamics now became dramatically faster. Okay, what actually happens now, you open a new decay channel, a okay, non radiative channel called Roger decay, where you have electron recombining with the color. And combination energy does not produce a photon, instead, is transferred either to the electron or to the hole and dissipates eventually as heat. It was very surprising at the time, okay? When I presented that for the first time, remember it clear, at that time, clear was accepting this type of talks. Uh, people won't believe me because why the semiconductor cut cell never show it as a recombination because you have to conserve energy and momentum and momentum conservation is very prohibitive, okay? In quantum dose, you relax momentum conservation, this be so it becomes extremely fast, okay? Orders of magnitude faster than radiative decay. Now, you are dealing with this paradoxical situation, right? For optical gain, you need bioxidons. These bioxidons states don't like to emit light. The decay version process, how you solve that, okay? So we solved it on the same year, so this paper was published in the beginning of 2020, it's right before the fire, big fire in Los Alamos. <clears throat> we finished the experiments, okay? When we knew the time scales of the recombination, okay, that was important. Now, we figured out how to overcome this issue. First, of course, you need to create this bioxitonic state in the sufficient amount very fast, okay? That's totally doable in our left femtosecond laser, 100 femtosecond pump pulse is faster than even 10 picosecond by energy decay. But then you need to make sure that stimulated emission develops faster than OGA decay. And again, it's possible. Stim spontaneous emission, radiative decay 20 nanoseconds, stimulated emission collective effect. You can accelerate it. Just simply taking quantum dots closer together. This is what we did, okay? Mungi Bavendi was sending us samples. Okay, we assembled them in the film, pumped with femtosecond pulses, okay? And the first experiments were done at uh, low temperature, 80 Kelvin. Usually you start with lasing at low temperatures. We were super excited when we saw that, okay? So you crank up the pump power, and narrow peak shows up in this avalanche-like fashion, okay? So very, very sharp growth, signature of the lasing effect, single pass, amplified spontaneous emission action, okay? So same year, and I was, we, Los Alamos was evacuated. I was sitting in a hotel in Santa Fe writing the second science paper, uh, which reported this findings. So we were lucky because afterwards we actually were delayed by a year. Because some of our laser physically burned in this Los Alamos fire. All right. Um, so 2000, right? There's still not quantum dot laser. You can buy a quantum dot TV set, but no quantum dot laser. So what's the problem? You have to use femtosecond pulses to pump this thing, okay? Quite intense, it, it's not very practical, okay? It's a big machine, amplified lasers, which you, we use in our experiments, okay? So you need to do something, and it's something, of course, you need to control the recombination. This is the theory, okay, which I uh, put together back around 2014. Uh, typically, um, lasing people don't like the recombination, and therefore they don't work. Uh, with uh, materials which show very fast Roger combination. There were no theories of optical gain in media with stronger Roger combination, so I had to uh, you know, create some kind of theory. It was truncated harmonic oscillator model, so I considered only the ground state, single extant, by extant states, put them together. Okay, and the theory emerged, which actually predicted that uh, the lifetime of the optical gain, of course, controlled by the by extant lifetime, and if you're thinking about CW pumping, continuous wave laser, which probably a first step towards electrically pumped laser, okay, what happens is that uh, for standard to combination, about 50 picosecond, the threshold is 10 to the fifth watt per centimeter square. So you need 100 kilowatt per centimeter square. Of course, it's crazy pump power, so you're going to burn your colloidal quantum dot material. In order to become practical, so you need to somehow temper of the recombination lengthen it to about one nanosecond, and then you are in the range of maybe a few kilowatt per centimeter square. You can sustain that with quantum dots for a limited period of time, okay? And that time, actually, the dots were available. Again, dots which uh, 
uh, were presented for the first time in 2008. It's our group and Dibichu group. So it's giant gut selenide core, thick gut sulfide shell developed for a different reason. We all were thinking about non-blinking single dot emission. They don't blink and uh, uh, it was very interesting. But two papers were basically came one month apart. Okay, so the same approach because gut sulfide simply uh, no uh, latest mismatch with gut selenide is very easy to grow thick shell. Okay, that's what we did. <clears throat> but turns out that if you make a big uh, gut sulfide shell, electron is delocalized, so you increase the localization volume, and as a result, you suppress the recombination due to volume scaling, something again what we discovered back in the days. Just to share lifetime scales directly with the volume. So you can get uh, the real lifetime about 700 picosecond, and the lasing power uh, at, at the threshold is about 10. Uh, kilowatt per centimeter square, and these are experiments, okay? So experiments done mostly in Toronto, so 10 sergeant. So we did a bit of theory for TED and also single dot measurements, but again, all uh, heavy lifting was done in Toronto, okay? And uh, they put quantum dots, this type of giant quantum dots on a two-dimensional photonic crystal, and here we go. Yeah, we had a CW lasing effect, but again, guys, <laughs> takes a long time, right, between one accomplishment and this field. <laughs> then you need dots, and then you again need to figure out theory, so 17 years, okay, to get from pulse lasing to CW lasing, right? Okay, and uh, of course, now that's even more challenging problem, right? So we need to make everything now into an electroluminescent device, right? So, and of course, if you have this 10 uh, kilowatt optical power, uh, electrical cross-section, I'm going to talk about that, about 100 times less. So you need currents of about 100 amp per centimeter square, which is not trivial, again, for uh, this time of devices, right? So it's one challenge. So you need extremely high current densities, and quantum dots must survive at this type of uh, current densities. You need to maintain stable bioexistoning population in your sample versus like standard situation where you have just single exitoning population in your displays. Okay, and then, of course, what's happening in uh, these electroluminescent devices, you haven't heard of this uh, conference LED talks, but what typically quantum dot LED is, it's a single monolayer of the quantum dots, maybe two quantum dot monolayers, and you just carry this from both sides, electron from one side hole, from the other side, and the reason is you want to avoid transport. <laughs> Sasha was talking about this. Transport, but LED people are practical people, okay? They are not trying to force against the nature, so they just find the solution, right? And this is how we deal with it. But in order to generate optical gain, single monolay is not enough. There's not enough gain, so we need at least two, three monolays, but still not a lot of gain you generate with just three monolays. I'm going to show you the results where we do that. But it's also a challenge, right? In order to inject carries, you have to have all this charge injection contact, you have to have charge transport lace, sometimes blocking lace, and ch sometimes charge generation lace, and they're all conductive, and of course, there is a lot of optical losses. So the gain generated in the thin quantum that medium must overcome all these losses, you know, all these multiple lace which you have in your electroluminescent device. Okay, so with that, if you accomplish that, you can demonstrate AAC, but if you want to laser oscillations, right, Okay, some cases AC is okay, amplifiers are okay, but many cases require oscillations, right? Laser or laser diet electrical, you need a cavity, and cavity, of course, you need to incorporate in such a way as not to interfere with charge injection pathways, and that is additional challenge, okay? I'm gonna tell you how I addressed all these challenges one by one. Okay, uh, let's first again a little bit of theory. Again, this is uh, what I did more recently, just trying to analyze the excitation cycle of an LED, standard LED, versus the laser diet. Okay, in the LED, okay, we circulate the quantum dot between the ground state, typically called so-called inverted architecture in Jack Hurst electron. You create a singly charged quantum dot, and that reduces Coulombic barrier for injection of the hole, so selectively, preferential effect is not injection of the second electron, but injection of the hole, you create a neutral exciton, and then this exciton recombines, producing a photon going to the ground state, so you, this is the normal LED cycle, okay? Then if you run your calculations, you see that in order to get very high brightnesses of thousand or million candela per centimeter square in your display, 400, 600 candela per centimeter square, this is what you need for daylight displays, perfect light, for example, Turns out, 
you can actually get there with just small population of the excited quantum dust. So you can just 10% of the quantum dust um, excited with a single exciton and you get a million candela from your device. Okay, so it's not very challenging. Okay, that's why all quantum dot LEDs operate at currents less than one amp per centimeter square. Okay, so not very high currents, but they allow you to get to very high brightnesses. Okay, when you are aiming to get to the regime of optical amplification, now you need bi excitons. In fact, let's consider a situation of like intermediate population inversion when you have half of the maximal gain in the system. Maximal gain in the system, 100% of those have bi excitons. Okay, half saturated gain, 50% of the dose have bi excitons, 50 single excitons, okay? So basically, and of course, there is no quantum dots in the ground state. So you have to circulate your quantum dots in a completely different cycle. You have to start with a single exciton, inject electron, create a negatively charged exciton, so-called negative prime, inject a whole bi exciton, then you go back, okay, preferentially radiatively, of course, you have to deal with Auger. Importantly, you have to pick up your quantum dot right here, okay, before it goes into this cycle and brought it again to the prime. Right, and to do that, of course, you need very high current densities. Again, okay? you run the theory, so kinetic equation, you see that excitation rate, which you need to get into the cycle, okay, is about one divided by the bi exciton lifetime. Okay, so how that translates into a current density? So this is what we introduced, I think, in this paper for the first time, so called electrical cross section of the quantum dot. People familiar with the optical cross-section just describes the ability of the quantum dot to capture photons from the incident stream of photons. And the electrical cross-section, again, describes the ability of the quantum dot to capture electrons and hold from the flowing current. And of course, intuitively, you see that it should be linked to the geometrical size of the quantum dot. In fact, we are lucky, it's actually bigger. Quantum dots are surrounded by the ligand, Okay, so that create in a uh, not penetrable membrane. Okay, so you have a little bit of current focusing effect, approximate by a factor of two electrical cross sections. What we see for our quantum is usually twice as large as the geometrical cross section because of the effect of these insulating ligands around the quantum dose, and that's good, okay? So we can actually enhance our electrical cross section. Again, taking uh, into account, again, this geometrical cross section, translation between electrical and geometrical, you now translate okay, this excitation rate into the current density, something that we can measure. Get this quantity, so the current density scales inversely with the bi exciton lifetime, again, limited by the Auger process, typically and the geometrical cross-section, okay? If you use this formula and run it for standard quantum dots, medium-sized dots with radius three nanometer, the bi-exciton lifetime limited by the Auger process, 100 picosecond, what you get? 2.5 kilo per centimeter square. Okay, at that time when we just did this calculation, okay, we thought it's high, we can do it now, okay? But anyway, at that time we thought, no, 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 we need to do something. Okay, we need to do something to reduce Okay, the threshold, and for that, what do we need? We need either to lengthen Auger lifetime or to increase geometrical cross-section, preferentially do both, right? Okay, and that is, turns out to be possible, okay, if you make this type of new giants, new giant quantum dots, where you have a cut cell and a coal, we call it with a shell not of cut sulfite as previously, but cadmium, zinc, selenite, and the shell is greater, so you have more uh, selenium at uh, the center of the quantum dot and on the surface of the quantum dot and then progressively you enrich uh, the shell with zinc and that leads to this uh, funny shape of the confinement potential from such a when you that is what we want to suppress with recombination. Okay, so gradual confinement potential helps to reduce Auger recombination rate and simultaneously this big shell, type one type shell helps us to collect charges and funnel them into the core. Importantly, when we made these quantum dots, we measured the Bikeson lifetime. Now it's more than, it's a lifetime, it's more than two nanoseconds. The quantum wave of bioxetones in emission becomes more than 40%. So instead of fully non-emissive species, they become highly emissive species. And of course, you know, we use that, okay? Follow up studies for the first time, we demonstrated now optical gain with electrical pumping for a single monolay in this paper. 
Okay, we use these dots now to demonstrate the viability of the charged exciton concept published a bit later. Okay, and so we'll also look at single dot properties, <laughs> dots which were designed for suppression of free recombination, beautiful single dot emitters. Okay, not only complete suppression of blinking, but also complete suppression of spectral diffusion, just in line with the sub KT at room temperature 15 MeV. Okay, so due to also suppression to couple of coupling to phonons. So really cool quantum dots, but excellent, excellent glazing material. Of course, they show a very interesting electroluminescence. Okay. <laughs> um, interesting electroluminescence, but again, so in order to, go to, to get to this type of the lasing regime, what this does show strong suppression of the recombination in order to get actually the regime of optical gain, we need about 50 amp per centimeter square versus standard about one amp or less. Okay, high, okay. Uh, well, no, it's actually the half saturated gain, and for, for gain threshold, even less, 5M, but still higher uh, than what is used in standard LEDs, okay? So to get there, you can do a couple of tricks, something with people, actually, not our invention, okay? You just limit the injection area. In this case, we just did a slit in the insulating interlayer in lithium fluoride in our LED devices, and then we did an orthogonal strip metal electrode, and that confines uh, now the flow count into to this very small area of 300 micron by uh, 50 micron. And uh, next week was just to use pulsed excitation. Right now we're using pulses with about one microsecond duration. So the first trick when you confine the injection area helps you just to improve the heat exchange with the environment. When you use pulses, you just give time for the your excitation volume to cool down between situational laser pulses. Okay? And when you do these things, you start seeing very interesting spectra in electroluminescence, so this is standard band age emission, but as you crank up the current density, and now look here, okay, we can go to 1,000 times per centimeter square without destroying our device, so we can go back and forth, nothing happens to our device, and if this type of current density is 1,000 amp, the second band pops, pops up, and this second band, band is due to this second state, so not only we fully saturate the bandage transition, fully invert the bandage, we're fully <laughs> saturating the next state. Okay, one P. Something what people in optics rarely see, so it's very hard to actually maintain dots, stable dots in this situation when you populate fully one S and one P state. Now we have a system which can amplify due to both one S and one P states. Okay, so we showed that. So we have optical gain medium, which is fully inverted for two, two transition, but no amplified spontaneous emission. Okay, and this is explainable, right? If you again, we analyze the structure of our device, we measured absorption, optical absorption of each layer, and what we determined, a couple of bad things, right? Molar oxide is bad. On one side, this is the site from which we typically inject holes. Okay, ITO, from which we inject holes, is also bad. Large absorption, right? This is a very typical architecture, but it's not gonna work uh, in your laser diet. We had to completely redesign our device, right? So we replaced the top layer with all inorganic charge injection, charge transport layer for holes. And we modified also the electron injection side by combining ITO uh, with silica 50-50, okay? Not only helps reduce absorption, but it also helps us uh, to reduce so-called mode pooling, high index material underneath the quantum dot pulls the mode that reduces actually the model gain coefficient in this quantum dot layer. Okay, and it's important. In this experiment, we use six monolayer quantum dot. Okay, and that turns out to be important. First of all, of course, uh, and importantly, this device incorporate also so-called distributed feedback resonator. It's just a one-dimensional grating incorporated directly in the bottom ITO uh, silica oxide electrode. And then you do your photonic modeling, photonic measurements, so you see feedback, strong feedback, signified by this large stop band. So in this structure, feedback occurs in the second order along the grating, and that's actually very often used in laser devices because now you have orthogonal first order, which allows you to out couple light. So that's pretty much the configuration, very popular in DFB devices. Okay, it works on the optical pumping. Okay, so we see a beautiful lasing effect, DFB single mode lasing. Okay, at 80 Kelvin, if you heat up our device, so the lasing disappears at about 150, 200 
Kelvin, okay, and we believe these are losses coming from the top silver electrode. Okay, it's not shown here. Okay, what happens under electrical pumping? Nothing. Okay, we see broadening of the line and nothing happens, no lasing effect because we have very thick quantum dot line heats up. Okay, it heats up and that destroys our optical gain and, um, and does not allow us to produce lasing. So we need to do better job. Okay, just designing the device. First of all, we need to reduce the number of the layers of the quantum dots and we need to structure electric field in such a way as to increase the field intensity within the quantum dot layer simultaneously reduce field in the surrounding charge conductive layers which are also optically lossy. And for that, actually again went back to the literature. Okay, that's a very cool paper, 1976. Okay, yeah, in the RF, this they invented this waveguide that they used to guide light in the low index medium in air. Typically you guide light in the high index medium, but if you use so-called Bragg reflector approach where you have an air gap between two distributed Bragg reflectors, then you can shape the field changing the structure of your DBR in the way you want. You can actually do something like that that can confine the field in the air gap. Okay, this is what we need. We need actually free control for the electric field in our devices. We reproduce this DRW approach, Bragg reflector waveguide approach in our devices. Instead of assembling on a plain substrate, our devices will assemble them on the distributed Bragg reflector DBR. Okay, they put also this top silver mirror, which acts as an optical reflector. Essentially, it reflects the bottom DBR, for forming this top DBR. We have now a quantum dot solid, which is incorporated in the photonic gap of one dimensional photonic crystal, right? And in this way now we can shape the field in the way we want by changing the structure of the DBR. Now you see we emphasize the field within free monolayer quantum dot layer and reduce field intensity to zero within lossy layers. Okay, this is what we want. As a result, losses are dropping to 15 inverse centimeter. Model gain, mode confinement factor is high, 20%. Model gain is about 80 centimeters, so we have net optical gain, okay? Making this device, okay, pumping it electrically, just very weak edge emission coming from the spontaneous radiative process. We crank up the current, okay, we see the appearance of one S AC band, one P AC band, okay, and a two kilo per centimeter square, these two bands dominate the spectrum. And of course, we see all the signatures of light amplification, very sharp growth of intense, almost no light before the threshold, then light, boom, just lights up. Okay, line airing, all the signatures of amplification. Also, guys, I'm not gonna, since I'm kind of running out of time, it's some optical calculations also. So because this device exhibits very peculiar polarization properties, exactly consistent with light amplification, because TM mode in these devices doesn't propagate, cannot be amplified, okay? So it's, there is very strong optical losses. So we can only see TM device in optical amplification. Exactly what is happening, this sharp features only appears in T light, okay? Do not appear in the TM light as expected. And furthermore, we pump our devices electrically. This is what we see, the one polarization, the other polarization, TE, non-polarized light, now we turn off our current and excite optical, same features, okay? So all is real. And people working on the leasing, of course, ultimate check is so-called variable stripe measurements, okay, where you don't change the power, but just change the size of the excitation spot. And typically it's just a stripe-like excitation. You change the length of the strain going from small to large. Okay, if you have amplification, certain length for a constant excitation, you see the bands pop up. That's what's happening. Okay, so small stripe, bigger stripe, you see the effect. Okay. Victor, give us time to ask you questions. There are Let 10 minutes show, left. To show me a couple of One things. more minute. Can I borrow against U.S. debt, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just add five minutes. <laughs> All right, and this is room temperature photo, guys, okay? Here we see like quantum dot LED. Now, look, this is H area, 10 micron squared, slides up after the threshold. We brought our people from the technology transfer office to impress them, they were like, wow. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, so it's generate right now, uh, 200 
uh, microwatt uh, divided by this area, the power two kilowatt per centimeter square CW. <laughs> Impressive, right? So it's a laser. It's only a single pass laser, okay? Reproducibility, beautiful. Okay, so um, this is what required for nature. Of course, we did the, all these checks. So 15 chips, eight devices. So 120 devices. We checked each chip, shows the same effect with a single device. So it's just examples. So AC. You remember about the paper, uh, like lowest threshold, achievable with the structures. Average threshold, 15 per centimeter square. Stunning. That's exactly the lowest threshold which you can achieve with a semiconductor laser at room temperature. Stability right now, you know, four hours, nothing happens. I mean, intensity drops, but AC preserved. And the conclusions? And the conclusions. <laughs> okay, this is our laser oscillator, guys. So, incorporating the H cavity, it's not published yet. You are first to see that. Okay, sharp band pops up. All right. And further reading, if you're interested, so this is like general aspects of lasing. So Nature Materials contacted us. We wrote this review. Then Nature Photonics contacted us. They want to actually just a review with focus on uh, problems which you face when you want to make an electrically pump device. Okay, this is important paper that came out right before this Nature where we show that device which operates is not fully excited laser, but can also run current densities of 2,000 amps per centimeter square. So that's quite exciting. And that's the paper just came out on the 4th. So it's been on the nature for about two weeks. It's already 17,000 excesses. So yeah, people apparently, 17,000 in two weeks. So people apparently very interested because as I said, biggest thing, of course, solution processable optical gain media for chip applications. And people, of course, are interested in that. This is what review we published uh, with a group of individuals across, across uh, the globe. So it just tells you that quantum is actually becoming reality. So it's not just a toy. All right, so there's a lot of things going on right now with quantum dots. Very exciting. And this is the crowd over several generations, three generations of postdocs. And a lot of credit goes to two guys, okay? This is our electrical engineer and optical engineer from Seoul. Nam Yang Yan and Clement Devaj did all the, most of the optical measurements, so great guys. And all great guys, of course. Okay, this is my small team, we used to be about 30 now. With newly funding, reducing, this is how it works in our collaborators. Thank you guys, and sorry for the time. All right, we have a little bit more than five minutes, uh, Sasha. Victor, you, you show the lasing, it is, uh, this quantum does require a tremendous amount of engineering. Uh, so you show this uh, lasing working for two electron volt, I think, as transition. Mm -hmm. uh, is, it, is it easy to make the same type of engineering for, say, 1.8 electron volt uh, radius laser? No, I mean, I, you mean for wavelength? Yeah. I mean, you need other dots, not cut cell. And we're working on that, and uh, we are working with mercury right now. So mercury-based materials, so two, two types. Uh, huh? Different materials. Different materials. Yeah, you cannot do that with cut cell. Yeah. Congratulations, Victor. Very nice achievement. And uh, I want to ask about the um, this, the layers of the nanocrystals you mentioned are very critical to go down to three, for example. Uh -huh. So a little bit technical, how you do that, why it's so essential to be so thin, and what about the surface chemistry between the dots with uh, getting charge across and all those inject charge injection between the dots as well? Okay. Of course, if you just think about optical device, the more the monolays the better, to a certain extent. Okay, that's why this device works with optics, but didn't work with electrical pumping, because here you have transport across six monolays, and of course, resistivity, serial resistance is very high, that leads to heating up the device. Basically, we come to the threshold, and we see, you can measure temperature just analyzing the redshift of your emission, and we see it's 100K over to what we want to be. And turns out that not only are there like things happening in the quantum, it turns out that I don't show the silver, silver is right there. Uh, the 
absorbance, optical absorbance in silver turned out again. There's a lot of like digging in the literature, depends on temperature. Turns out that plus 100K dramatically increases optical absorption in silver. Silver is also uh, made by very, very cheap method. It's, uh, it's evaporation is not like, you know, like crystal silver. And turns out it's granular, silver, uh, temperature is critical. So it increases optical absorption. So basically the, the, that's the problem. That's why we want to go to Hina. So to reduce at least serial resistance on this end. And that helped. Because it's actually dramatic, I would say. Helped dramatically because we don't see any overheating now. <clears throat> and the surface chemistry? You know, you would be surprised. Aleic acid. <laughs> Sorry? Aleic acid. acid. That's it. Original. When we, you know, we did that. We started messing up with surfaces, as always, but quantum mill drops, you know, generate traps. Aleic acid, brutal force. That's it. 2000 temp. <laughs> Victor, I, very nice talk. Um, Maybe I want to connect it a little bit more to two questions. Mm -hmm. One about the building blocks uh, to optimize the devices. And my understanding is that you want to reduce the Auger uh, recombination uh -huh. lifetime, which would suggest bigger particles because of the volume scaling. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, why don't you go to bigger particles? Because they're not as bright, or they're not in the right regime, or that's one question. The other one is, is there anything that our self-assembly friends can be useful for uh, designing? Is there any effect of how the particles are arranged in mm -hmm. the layer to right. the, the lasing? Uh, right. So first question, of course we want to stay in the quantum dot regime, okay? Because uh, we heard some talks very recently at uh, the conference in Valencia uh, from Dutch group, right? They use big cut sulfide particles which behave as bulk. And then you're not dealing with the quantum dots, right? Um, of course, you can make them lace, then color tunability. Uh, composition, you can change the composition, but we prefer to stay with the quantum dots. We see certain advantages, like lowest threshold, still, 30 m per centimeter square. Okay? That's why we actually still work with this small core, bigger shell, which helps us to reduce the shell, plus helps us to harvest charges, right? So that's the answer to the first question. And again, this is due to size quantization. You see what we have now, it's amplified spontaneous emission at four transitions. Okay, and there's big need actually for AC type light sources. Okay, so it's not a laser, it's AC type light, extremely bright, polarized, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Display people would love that. All right, and uh, second question was... The lattice is the assembly right. lattice. So what, we don't care about order, honestly. Uh, we only uh, care about the density. Okay, so if we have some spots, uncovered spot, of course, we have leaks, uh, we, we have shots. So basically, we just want a really dense coverage. That is important. And it's, again, it's spin coding, so it's just special regime of spin coding, something what uses it. They can make uh, binary mixtures. They can make other things. Would that right, have that any? That would be interesting. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, binary mixtures. We have worked with those. But again, even with a single material, okay, uh, strongly confined material, you see emission color mm -hmm. extends from red to green mm -hmm. for transitions. One S, one P. Uh, one S light, uh, heavy hole, light hole, P and D, and pretty much put a filter where you want and you get your color. So, yeah, binary may be interesting, but I don't believe we're going to work on that because I, I think that's enough what we have with this very broad bandwidth. All right, so maybe let's thank Victor again and we'll move to our last speaker of the morning session.